Thank you. 
Good evening and welcome to our very first virtual edition of WexMed Live. It's truly great to have so many of our supporters here joining us this evening to learn about the groundbreaking work being done at the Wexner Medical Center. In case we haven't met, I'm Hal Paz, Executive Vice President and Chancellor for Health Affairs at The Ohio State University and Chief Executive Officer of the Wexner Medical Center. I am a bit Sorry that uh, we're a few minutes uh, behind schedule. Um, you know, we've been doing these Zoom sessions now since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. We've done employee town halls with thousands of participants, and it was inevitable that at some point we would have a, a bit of a technical glitch. So uh, I truly am sorry we're 10 minutes behind schedule, but um, I so much appreciate you all joining us for this uh, in-person event tonight. Um, I think that uh, we're getting very familiar with Zoom and uh, the technology and uh, all that being said, I do look forward to when uh, we will be together again in person. It can't, as I know you all agree, can't come soon enough. With us uh, this evening, virtually but in person, you're going to hear from Dr. Peter Moeller, our Chief Scientific Officer, who will emcee the proceedings. Uh, you'll also hear from two of our leading healthcare experts who will share some of the amazing work that they're doing uh, as we uh, have time um, for questions and answers uh, at the end of the program. For those of you who are new to this event, welcome. Um, and uh, for those of us that have participated before, and that, that includes me, uh, I was uh, set to attend my first WexMed Live in, in March in, in Naples before the COVID pandemic hit. Um, I have uh, been looking forward to uh, the, uh, the event and uh, I know that uh, we'll have this opportunity again. But uh, since our last event, uh, we've welcomed uh, Christine M. Johnson as our 16th University President. This month, Dr. Carol Bradford joined us from the University of Michigan as our new Dean of the College of Medicine. And our Alumni Association, which is partners with us on these events in the past, also has a new leader, Molly Rance Calhoun. Uh, we hope to introduce you to all these uh, leaders at our next WexNet Live uh, program. As you all know, COVID-19 has been an exceptionally serious healthcare crisis, and, and that is truly an understatement. But that being said, I am enormously proud of the work that we've done and continue to do to keep all those who count on us safe and healthy as possible. But the COVID-19 pandemic is not the only crisis affecting us here today. We have our financial crisis, but we also have another challenge, which is the challenge of systemic racism in this country, which over the past several months has reached a boiling point. Racism is not just a health crisis, it is a social determinant of health. And while social determinants play a significant role in shaping everyone's health and overall well being, in communities of color, social determinants often equate to disparity. 
And this is evidenced by the fact that Black Amer Americans are more than twice as likely to die from COVID-19 as white Americans, for example. Here at the Wexner Medical Center and The Ohio State University, we have long committed to addressing these social determinants of health, but in the fast, past few months, we've even taken further action to address these issues. We were one of the first academic health centers in the nation to create an anti-racism action plan with specific steps to help our faculty and staff partner with our community to encourage equity in health and well-being. We've long championed diversity, equity, and inclusion, but undoubtedly there is so much more to do. And as we look to the future of the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, not only must we approach healthcare change, we also must continue to work across our campuses. So we are committed to leading the way in creating the academic health center of the future. Ohio State is one of the largest institutions with both a major health system and seven health science colleges located all on one campus. This means that integration of patient care research and education is crucial to our mission. The academic health system of the future will not need just the ideas and the people, but it also must have the right facilities. There's a real and pressing need to invest in state-of-the-art brick and mortar facilities to ensure that we have the means to care for all those that we serve. And we're investing in interdisciplinary research and education complexes that allow us to bring together resources from all parts of the health system and the university. We're building cutting edge ambulatory care centers that will provide care close to where people live. And we will create a new inpatient hospital to treat complex medical issues and provide greater access to our high quality care. We're advancing our strategy to transform our health system into a health platform focused on driving care into the home using virtual and digital solutions, as well as the new community care coach and a fleet of other mo mobile health vehicles. We truly believe that having this cutting edge forward looking health platform is absolutely the place where we educate interdisciplinary teams of health science students from all seven of our colleges, because that's the world that they will be living and practicing in. And it's extraordinarily important that we have not only state-of-the-art education and research, but also the state-of-the-art facilities to go with it. This is where supporters like you have an enormous opportunity to help us achieve this vision. Philanthropic support will be crucial to our, our ability to bring these new facilities to fruition. Collectively, those of you attending tonight have made an immeasurable impact on our patients' lives by supporting the Wexner Medical Center. And I can't thank you enough for all the ways that you continue to help us. In fact, this event is designed just to do that. By giving you a firsthand look at the vital research being done at the Wexner Medical Center, we hope you feel as much pride as we do. You are part of the team making these breakthroughs possible. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Peter Moeller, Vice Dean for Research at the College of Medicine and Chief Scientific Officer, who will introduce tonight's speakers. Peter? Hal, thanks for, um, thanks for the introduction. And, and on behalf of us all at the Wexner Medical Center, I wanna thank you for your leadership over the past few months. And, um, we're in a really good place because of you, so, so thank you. Um, I wanna thank the rest of you for, for joining tonight. Tonight is probably one of the, the most fun evenings. Um, certainly as our ninth um, Wexner Medical Center, Wexmed Live, we would have loved to be in Naples, Florida or Chicago or Cincinnati or maybe even Cleveland tonight um, to do this, but you'll be joining all of us in Columbus um, in, in our offices. So. Um, this is again gonna be a really fun, a fun time tonight. This is a chance to really highlight the great things that are happening at, at an academic medical center. We've heard a lot about COVID um, and we've heard a lot about the impact of what an academic medical center can do for really solving a crisis in real time. The ability to put together solutions that in one day that might be used the next day um, have really allowed us to, to move quickly and become a national leader. But one of the other great things about this academic medical center, the Wexner Medical Center, is that 
is that we're able to multi-purpose. And the fact that, um, that we have all this great COVID research and we're doing all these great things out in the community, all of this is happening at the same time that discoveries are being made in other areas. And, I, and as, as much fun as we're gonna to have tonight, I wanna to be serious for a second in that while COVID is happening, we can't forget that 800,000 people in this country die each year of cardiovascular disease. 700,000 people each year in this country die of cancer. There's an additional 200,000 people that are gonna suffer in the United States each year and pass because of things like diabetes and, Hals and Alzheimer's disease. What I wanna show you tonight with these great speakers is that while COVID is happening, there are continue to be great breakthrough advances in all of these other areas, that there are teams of committed physicians and staff and scientists and trainees that each day are coming up with new ways to come up with creative solutions to incredibly complex questions. And that can only happen at an academic medical center. So ground rules for tonight. Um, instead of listening to scientists talk for 45 minutes at a time, um, these are going to be crisp. They're going to be four to five to six minute talks. You're going to hear from two of some of our best people. Um, and, and you're going to see why really research and, and, and transformation and discovery are happening in leaps and bounds at Ohio State, whether it's in the College of Engineering or the College of Medicine or public health or dentistry. We've grown about 60% in our NIH funding in just two years. Great things are happening and, and look forward to sharing some of that tonight. So our first speaker, if we can bring on Dr. Fon. Um, I want to introduce him and we'll see his face in a second in a way. Um, Dr. Fawn joins us from that state up north. And as scientists, we get a chance to, to study evolution, to see how you can evolve things like the brain to deal with, with areas. We've also seen how you can evolve football players as they might evolve from a place like Michigan to Ohio State, or a scientist as they might evolve to com coming from Michigan to Ohio State. So I want to, um, very proudly introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Luan Fon, who represents um, the Charles Sinsaba Chair in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health. And while he'll just wave, he'll be back to answer questions later. Um, Want to want to cue the video, please? Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Well, thank you, Drs. Paz and Moeller, for the opportunity to share a bit about myself and our work with our community. And thank you to you all for joining us. Yes, I am a psychiatrist, but don't worry, I will be doing the talking and not you. And as obligated in public presentations, I do have to make some disclosures of potential conflicts of interest. I grew up in that state up north. I went to college there, I went to medical school there, I trained there as a resident, and I also earned my tenure there as a faculty member. So what's the bottom line? It turns out that through slow and deliberate evolution, maybe Darwin got it right about survival of the fittest, a Wolverine can actually become a Buckeye. It is an honor and a privilege to be here and to share with you my love for the brain and my passion as a psychiatrist. And as a scientist, I'm bringing the brain back to my field. Since the very first time and still now when I meet my patients, I've always asked, what is on your mind? I've also wondered what is going on in your brain? Today, this is how we see our brain. This amazing, beautiful organ the last frontier of medicine and science, and still largely unchartered. Our brain is made up of intricate connections and fibers, sending electrical signals and pulsations of chemicals from one part to another to help us see, hear, move, speak, think, and yes, feel. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My story actually begins some 26 years ago when I was in medical school. I fell in love with the brain as soon as my pathology and anatomy professors dissected it in front of us students. And when I could visualize those very same slices from images captured by the magnetic resonance imaging or MRI scanner, I fell in love even more. And in the classroom, we were taught that our brain was responsible for our senses, 
our movements, our language, our memory, and yes, our consciousness. How cool is that? A couple of years later, I graduated from the classroom to the clinic. And in my psychiatry rotation, I met my very first patients, including veterans at the Veterans Administration Hospital, who also served their country during the Vietnam War. They shared crippling anxiety, depression, memories of trauma, and were under immense stress, despite the fact that the war happened decades ago. You see, this was very personal for me because I come from a military family. My father and grandfather served alongside these very veterans, and I was born in Vietnam during that war. My patients often asked me, and so did I, do stress, trauma, and adversity injure the brain? Is my illness because of my brain? The answer should be yes and yes, right? So I turn to our Bible called the Robbins Pathologic Basis of Disease. You should know that every medical student strove to memorize every word in this thousand plus page book. This is my very first book published in 1994. It was the fifth edition explained everything about diseases of the body, where it came from, what it looked like. You turn to the last chapter, the brain chapter, known as the central nervous system, you would find explanations for stroke, for Alzheimer's disease, dementia, for brain tumors. But yet it explained nothing about anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, or addiction. How could this be? Luckily, a transformational approach New technologies were more emerging. With MRIs and EEGs, we can now finally study the brain while it was active. Not just gray white slices anymore, but actually images of the brain. While well, someone was listening, speaking, moving, thinking, and feeling. Together with my personal experience with patients and with those new tools that gave us a window into the mind, I decided to go into psychiatry and into research to pursue several questions that were unanswered at the time. In my lab, we began to study veterans. And over the last 20 years, we've studied patients with anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and addiction. We measure life experience. We assess for disease. We give treatment. And importantly, we measure brain function. And in doing so, we have been able to inform the field and even better, help our patients understand that their illness is not their fault, but is an illness of the brain. That new knowledge has been liberating. That new knowledge has reduced stigma. That new knowledge has, I think, led them to feeling better. So first, do stressful experiences like abuse and neglect as a child, like poverty, like racism, and other adversities change, even injure our brains. And as we can see here, yes, they do. Does traumatic experiences make an imprint onto our brains? Yes. Here we show, and in particular, if you look at the blue areas in these areas of the brain, the more stress, the more trauma, the less well this area of the brain works. This area called the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex is an important area for decision-making, for regulating our emotions, and for expressing ourselves. Can you imagine how you would do, what your life would be like if you had an injury to this area? Second, do the brains of our patients look different than others who are healthy? Yes. Here we show where in the brain patients are different than healthy people in one area important for negative emotion, an area called the amygdala, patients with depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, shown here when we measure amygdala reactivity in bars of orange, purple, blue, and burgundy, they have much more activity compared to healthy individuals, which is represented by the green bar. As an analogy, high amygdala, Activity here can be likened to high blood pressure or high blood sugar. I hope it makes sense that to better understand a brain illness, you need to measure the brain, the source, 
In other words, it needs to be as simple as a blood pressure cuff on your arm or from a blood draw. How can we begin to measure complicated things like emotion in the brain, like cardiologists measure heart function through analyzing blood pressure? And can we track the success of treatments in much the same way? Next, when patients get treatments, do their brains change? Here, we show that treatments such as medication and talk therapy can reduce that high amygdala activity. Each of these lines represent a change for each patient. And as you can see, the decrease doesn't happen for everyone. And it doesn't go down by the same amount. Some go down a bit, some go down a lot. It turns out that the more your amygdala or your brain changes, the more you get better with treatment. So that last phrase should make you scratch your head and make you pause. It did for me as well. Not all patients get better with treatment. Sadly, yes and true. Patients, when they come to the clinic, we typically offer two kinds of treatments, medication and talk therapy. Both treatments work, but they don't work for everyone. And because treatment takes tr weeks and months to work, it is imperative to recommend the right treatment for the right patient at that time. But we don't have any objective way to guide a patient to one treatment or the other treatment. So it's like flipping a coin for a clinician and we really need to do better at this. Using brain imaging, we now have been able to break through this barrier, and we can show that depending on what your brain looks like, how it reacts when you first come to the clinic, we can use those images to then predict how you would respond to a particular medication if you would get better with one treatment and not the other. We can make that prediction closer to 80%, which is much, much better than chance, much, much better than flipping that coin. So I believe this is the future of psychiatry and behavioral health, and the future is now. We are moving towards using objective tests based on brain function. We are leveraging the latest technologies in imaging, and I fully hope that soon portable MRIs and EEGs will be in the clinic so that patients can have these tests before they get treatment. Then we can use these tests to help patients better understand how their illnesses are not invisible, and then use these tests to get them to the best treatment. As psychiatrists, we can finally use imaging like heart doctors, like cancer doctors, like surgeons have been doing for decades. Ultimately, I look forward to a day that medical students can open up a new edition of Robbins and find answers about how psychiatric and mental illness is rooted in the brain. I'm really proud that we at The Ohio State University are contributing to this future and to this new knowledge and striving to improve our patients' lives in the clinic so that they can be the very best in their lives and in their community. Thank you so much for listening, for thinking, and for getting excited about this with me. Dr. Fon, thank you for such an incredibly motivating talk, and we're so we're so glad you're here at Ohio State. Um, just remind everyone that that Dr. Fon will be back in a few minutes to to answer any questions. And for all of you on the on the Wexmed live tonight, uh, just notice that there in the bottom of your screen is a little button that says Q and A. And if you have questions for either Dr. Fon or Dr. Paz, um, Dr. Pasquet, or myself, please make sure you put those in the in the uh, in the bar and we'll get to them at the end. So thank you, thank you Luan for your, for your time. I'd next like to bring um, um, Dr. Electra Paskett to the stage. And um, Dr. Paskett is an international leader. Um, and and I, when I say that it's, it's you know, I'm, she's very modest, but, but, but she truly is an international leader in this, in this area. Dr. Paskett is the Marion N. Rowley Professor of Cancer Research and, and really an incredible director of our cancer prevention and control um, group in, in the Department of Internal Medicine. She has led the way in not only the state of Ohio, but truly across our nation in understanding 
How do we get out to the community? How do we take our science that we're learning every day and, and make it mean something tomorrow? And, and so incredibly proud to, to have our have her here tonight. This is the second time she's been part of LexMed Live and it went so well that we brought her back tonight. Um, she's gonna talk tonight a little bit about some of her initiatives, one of very many that she has on her plate, um, looking at colon cancer, a disease that I mentioned cancer earlier, a disease that in colon cancer affects too many. Um, we've heard a lot about it in the news recently with the untimely passing of, of, of Chadwick Boseman. Um, she's excited to share her work tonight and I'm gonna let, let her take it from here. So thank you, Dr. Piscat. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Good evening. I am very excited to share with you new research we're conducting to achieve health equity here in Ohio strategies that can be implemented anywhere to address any health inequity. What do I mean by health equity? I love this cartoon because it really explains the difference between equality, where everyone, no matter their individual attributes, gets the same thing, a large man's bicycle to ride, and equity, where depending upon each person's attributes, they get the bicycle they need to be able to ride. How does this relate to health? Historically, we have used the principle of equality in addressing health. For example, how do we identify new scientific discoveries? We test one intervention used for all populations. We conduct complicated randomized controlled trials with long consent forms, mainly in English at universities with little to no input from the communities encountering disparities in the health condition under study. Moreover, once something is found to be effective, the majority of these evidence-based interventions are filed on the shelf after publication in scientific journals, the scientific method of success. The odds that a local clinician caring for patients that could benefit might someday hear about this intervention are slim to none. How can we instead reach populations that need help with the exact interventions proven effective that could help them? The answer comes in a new exciting type of research that we at the Wexner Medical Center are using called implementation science. What is different and exciting with implementation science is that at the core is the principle of listening to the community suffering with a disparity, getting their opinions as to why the problem exists and how to address the problem. Taking that information, we teach the community to help themselves. We teach them how to implement the interventions that best fit their needs. And we work with them to adapt the chosen interventions to meet their unique needs and abilities. The university research team serves as facilitators, consultants, and evaluators as the local teams implement the chosen and adapted intervention. Thus, we are teaching them to fish. Some examples of interventions that have been proven effective but on the shelf include HPV vaccination, which can eliminate 30 to 40,000 deaths in the U.S. each year. Physical activity and obesity prevention, which can reduce the chance of developing cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, and tobacco use reduction and prevention, also responsible for heart disease, cancer, stroke, and respiratory problems. Another example is one we are tackling at Ohio State University. We received cancer moonshot funding to conduct an implementation science study the Accelerating Colorectal Cancer Screening and Follow-Up Through Implementation Science Study, or ACCESS. Colorectal cancer, a preventable cancer through the use of screening tests, has higher death rates in three areas of the United States as shown here. In ACCESS, we are addressing the colorectal cancer disparity in Appalachian, Ohio, and Kentucky. Our site started this exciting study at the Quaker City Family Health Center, a small clinic with five staff dedicated to providing the best care to their patients. 
Unfortunately, colorectal cancer screening rates were very low among their age eligible patients. We began by understanding why colorectal cancer screening was low at Quaker City Health Center at three levels of influence, the clinic, provider, and patient. We learned that the staff had no easy way to identify who needed a colorectal cancer screening test while they had an electronic medical record system. They had no knowledge of how to run reports or identify who needed a test. The clinic did not have a protocol for the colorectal cancer screening process for staff to follow. The providers reported that during 10 minute clinic visits with patients, there was not enough time to begin a dialogue about colorectal cancer and screening. And when they did, they often were met with resistance from patients who did not have a clear understanding of colorectal cancer or screening and mostly complained about the prep from first-hand or second-hand knowledge. What did we do? We took this information and identified evidence-based interventions. Interventions that improved colorectal cancer screening in other settings and had been placed on the shelf and provided those to the staff. For example, we presented an educational session to the staff at Quaker Family Health Center and gave them tips on how to talk to their patients about colorectal cancer and screening in the 10 minute visit and how to address those who resist screening invitations. We asked them to develop a clinic colorectal cancer screening protocol. We suggested they mail fit screening kits to their patients who need a test, preceded by a phone call and use patient navigation skills to navigate patients to complete the test and follow up on those with positive test results. The clinic formed an implementation team led by the clinic champion tasked with choosing interventions from those we selected and deciding how and when to implement them. The health system provided colorectal cancer screening rates quarterly to help monitor impact. How did the team react to our plan? The educational session and the protocol were well accepted. However, at the initial meetings with the implementation team, they said, we can't do fit outreach. We just don't have the time. We said, that's okay. Let's work on what you can do. And we taught them how to run a list of who needed screening. Then they looked at the list and said, I think we can do fit outreach. And they came up with a plan. They ran a list of who needed screening. They divided up the list by week and using navigation skills, which we taught them, they began calling patients on their list. Using navigation skills again, the staff navigated patients who do not return a test as well as those with positive fit tests to colonoscopy. So what happened? Patients accepted the fit test, test kits were mailed out tests were returned. Colorectal cancer screening rates at the clinic increased by 15%, even during COVID. Some tests were positive and staff navigated those patients to colonoscopy. Late one Friday afternoon, an excited staff member called and said, we navigated a positive fit to colonoscopy and the patient had 10 polyps removed. They knew what that meant. They had prevented a colon cancer in that patient. The take home message is clear. To reach health equity for all populations, for all persons, for whatever conditions we are looking at, we must understand the unique needs of the community we are working with. Focus on multiple levels of influence relevant to this issue, the community, the clinic, provider, and patient and family. Find, adapt, and implement evidence-based interventions that address the specific needs and barriers of this population. Teach communities and clinics how to improve their own health and help them understand the impact of their efforts on their community and patients. Thus, we're not just giving them a fish, we are teaching them to fish, which is acceptable and sustainable as well as can be applicable to any other health issues.
We are conducting similar implementation science studies now, not just for colorectal cancer in Appalachia, but also for HPV vaccination, cervical cancer screening and tobacco use in four Appalachian states, for breast cancer screening among African-American women in 12 counties in Ohio, and we are preparing a new grant to stand up to cancer for eliminating cervical cancer in the Big Ten using this process. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. In incredible work. Um, and and want to thank you again for all that you're doing. I, I think we all, all 125 of us on the webinar tonight wonder when you probably sleep. So if I could inv invite the other, um, the other guests back to the, back to the, the stage. Um, and maybe if, if you're okay with it, Dr. Paskett, um, maybe start with you on, on some of the questions. So some of the, the Q&A that are coming from the, from the group tonight, um, it really sounds like unlike, you know, a scientist that has test tubes and beakers, that really your laboratory is the state. And sort of a, sort of a two-part question, you know, one, what are some of the, the obstacles you deal with? You talked about dealing with COVID when you are running your studies. And I think the second question is, is how do you communicate across some of these other groups? You mentioned that there's three big groups across the country that have similar interests in, in working in underserved and in and, and, and communities. How do you guys talk to each other and how can you share information to, to make the impact even more? Right. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about my research. Um, and I, I want to first say that I do this with my team. It's not just me. It's all of us. And, and we all do it because we're dedicated to what we do. And um, the obstacles we face are, first of all, distance. Second of all, the need is so great. There are so many things that, that we could you know, really focus on. And then, um, as I mentioned, the crux of our work deals with the community. So we have to go on the community's timetable. We have to go at the community's level. And sometimes that's not in line with our NIH or our grant funders timetable, but we have to be attributable to the community needs. And the last thing I'll mention is a lot of the communities we work with have basic social determinants of health that they're dealing with, transportation, uh, et cetera, uh, food shortages, uh, et cetera, that they're dealing with that, that often get in the way. How do we communicate with, with groups? Well. Um, that map that you saw, we, uh, a part of ACCESS, the colon study, um, are our colleagues from uh, UNC doing the North Carolina part. And we are working together with them, collaborative uh, protocols, papers, and common data elements. So uh, they're doing a little different model than we're doing, but we're working on the, the same issue. Uh, we, have, we work across our neighboring states, as I mentioned, with Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia very easily. We do a lot of Zoom, we do a lot of calls, and uh, we've worked together for a long time, and we get to go along to get, uh, together because we're, again, focused on addressing the needs uh, of our community. And we're so successful in what we do that that last area on the, the map, with, which is the Delta, we got called by my friend at, at LSU to come and, and work with them so that they can replicate some of the things we're doing down to address uh, the other area of high colon cancer mortality rates. That's great. And, and congratulations again, all the super work that's happening across the James and the CCC and, and the College of Medicine and the Wexner Medical Center. Um, Dr. Fon, next, next question for you and um, sort of a, a second a two-part question. Um, so the first is, when you think about some of the brain imaging that you talked a little bit about, um, can you apply it to a host of different phenotypes? Meaning someone that might have a very stressful behavior that's transient in nature, you know, you've just been diagnosed with, with something, um, would you see you know, response there? And then how are you working across teams to adapt this? Meaning that at an academic medical center, is our people in psychiatry working with people in radiology and neurology, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about those relationships? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, um, Peter. Um, that's both a, a really great question and a dense one. And um, I wanna be brief and, and sensitive to our time. Uh, 
we're certainly trying to study diseases which are often very chronic in nature. Uh, but to, to truly address the question about, can we measure things dynamically? Can we measure things in the, the moment? The, the answer is yes. The trick is that for us to put in an EEG machine or get someone in an MRI man, uh, scanner, it takes 20, 30 minutes to an hour. So if we could do that, the answer is yes. However, we and others are trying to simplify the measurement. So instead of having to put in a cap that's got 32, 64 electrodes on your brain, we're trying to reduce it down to eight electrodes. So the cap goes on very quickly. So yes, to answer your question, we are working on, on getting more transient measurements in the laboratory that we can then implement in the clinic. I think the question is a very good one in which stress kind of comes out of nowhere. You can't predict when it comes. And if you're a patient getting a diagnosis, that stress is immense at the moment. And so how do you cope? How do you get a measure and then cope simultaneously in, in real time is, is, a, is a challenge for us, but it's a challenge we're, we're taking on. In terms of collaborations, I am so lucky to have come to the Wexner Medical Center and to work with neurologists and neurosurgeons and neuroscientists all on the same campus collaborating one, with one another. Um, we are now beginning to take these measures uh, and think about uh, these diseases as one syndrome, Parkinson's disease, stroke, um, uh, even a central tremor as a, as a disease that's often been in the neurology clinic and the neurosurgery clinic. But these patients often also have depression, anxiety, and addiction. So how can we partner with each other to use the same kind of brain measurements? And then how can we leverage a new technology and a new treatment? So I actually have great projects with neurosurgeons using the state of the science techniques to modulate the brain using deep brain stimulation, using ultrasonic pulse, uh, pulsations to the brain that are gonna be not only in the neurology clinic, but also in the psychiatry clinic. So this collaboration for us in the Neurological Institute is really, really exciting. That's, that's incredible. Um, Dr. Paz, if I could ask you the next question, you know, we've heard a lot in the last sort of 30 to 40 minutes about the breakthroughs in, in research, the breakthroughs in innovation that are happening in buildings that may have been built, you know, 20 years before Dr. Fon's, you know, textbook was, 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 was written. Um, and, and medicine has changed, science has changed. Can you update us on kind of where we stand with new facilities that will enable us to move faster, quicker, better, safer for the patients here in Central Ohio and around the country? Yeah, thanks, Peter. You know, um, we do have a few facilities that are ready to be uh, retired. Um, one is even older than I am. Um, and uh, there's some real opportunities. So as I talked before about a health platform, it's about how do you create this infrastructure of bricks and mortar on one hand, but also virtual health care on the other. And how do you drive care into the home? And we've proven this now with telemedicine. We went from doing 50 telehealth visits a month back in February to now doing 2,800 a day. It's extraordinary. And we're, as I mentioned before, mobile vans that are driving out into the community to drive care into local communities to bring care into the home. But at the same time, as we learned during the height of the pandemic, we need a lot of ICU beds. And it just doubles down and reemphasizes the importance of those kind of services that you're only gonna find at a place like the James or University Hospital or the Ross heart and vascular hospital, brain and spine, these kind of facilities, particularly at a time when the care, and as you heard from, from our colleagues, gets more and more complex, more and more sophisticated. We need the facilities and resources to be able to do that. In University Hospital, this is the building that we're replacing now. We're gonna go from having operating rooms that are roughly about 500 square feet to 750 square feet to to be able to put that lo those large machines in place to do imaging, like you just heard about a few minutes ago, in a state-of-the-art fashion. And in this new hospital tower that we're building, 
we're going to have 840 beds, many of which will be critical care beds. It's extraordinarily important because Ohioans, people across the state and the region, have come to depend on us for all these vital services. Now, that said, we need other facilities as well. We need a state-of-the-art interdisciplinary research building for areas like immuno-oncology, for heart and vascular and pulmonary disease, to bring researchers together onto these single platforms to form the collaborations that you heard about a few minutes ago. And also, we're building an interdisciplinary education building as well. We have, as you heard, the largest academic, virtual academic health science campus in the nation, seven colleges, 10,000 students at one time. What a phenomenal opportunity to bring these students together across many disciplines to learn together in teams. And then of course, three ambulatory care buildings across the region. The first one that's going up is in New Albany. There's one planned in Dublin, and then there's one going on in West Campus right near where that research is, building is going, which will be home to the James outpatient facilities. These are the things that we need to do to serve Ohio, to serve all the patients and families we care for across the region, but also at the national level to be that place where people come when they need the kind of services that we provide here at the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center. That's incredible. And, and I know, you know, we, we started a little bit late, so we don't have time to go through a whole lot of questions, but one follow-up. You mentioned, you know, both Dr. Fawn and Dr. Pasquet mentioned working in teams and creating, you know, bringing trainees through pipelines to, to get there. You know, in the past, we had educated where a medical student would be med educated in the College of Medicine and a nursing student in the College of Nursing and an engineer was sort of three miles away. Can you can you talk a little bit about your vision and, and what you're doing in the Wexner Medical Center to bring some of these people together that, that can answer some of these complex questions that we've heard about tonight? Sure. It, you know, every, every other part of society, every other sector of the economy has come to the realization that it's by working across teams that we can achieve our best results. And we've also learned that here at Ohio State. It's how we leverage all the resources. And it's not just on the health science campus. It's in engineering, it's in physics, it's in agriculture, it's in the social sciences and the liberal arts. That's how we address health and well-being. People's health is impacted not just by the health care they receive, but also by social, behavioral, environmental, genetic determinants of health. And in, one of the unique things about this university is we can bring all these resources to bear for collaborative research, collaborative education, and ultimately for collaborative patient care. It allows us to be that model of the future. We have a responsibility to educate all these students in the ways in which care will be delivered 40 years from now, because that's how long they're gonna be practicing, not how it was delivered 40 years ago. And that's what this work is all about. And that's why my colleagues here who are doing this cutting edge research really lead the way in this extraordinary team-based approach to coming up with innovation and discovery, which is what has to set us apart. Yeah, well, well thank you. And, and I wanna be sensitive, we wanna be sensitive to everyone's time tonight and, and wanna thank our, our guests. Um, before I turn it back over to you, Dr. Paz, um, really wanna let everyone know that we have a list of your questions and answers and your names, and we look forward to getting back with each and every one of you and, and um, thanks my thanks to you, Dr. Paz, Dr. Fawn, and, and, and Dr. Paskett for, for, for doing this tonight. So Dr. Paz, turn this back over to you to, to close us out tonight, and, and thank you again. Well, well, thank you very much, Peter, and thank you to my colleagues. Everyone did an outstanding job tonight, and I want to thank all of our guests for joining us virtually. Um, we are looking forward to the other side of this pandemic when we're all going to be back together in a space. But in the meantime, we've planned our next WexMed Live. It'll be on December 9th. We look forward to seeing all of you there. It'll be another exciting, really exciting program. Um, and uh, I hope you'll join us. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves, be well, and uh, look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you so much for being with us.